The July 12th, 2023 meeting of the Economic Development Technology and City Light Committee will come to order. It is 9.30. I'm Sarah Nelson, Chair of the Committee. Will the clerk please call the roll? Council President Juarez. Hi, been here. <laughs> Council Member Sawant. Council Member Strauss. Present. Council Member Herbold. Chair Nelson. Present. Three present. Two absent. All right. Well, let's get started. We've got two items on today's agenda. The first is the final appointment to the new Seattle Film Commission. And the second is a roundtable discussion with directors of the city's business improvement areas. And we'll talk about operational barriers to um, small businesses these days. And uh, let's see. We will now move into public comment on the items listed on the agenda. And we'll start with the in-person commenters and people will have two minutes to speak. And when uh, the, for a call in, for people that are calling remotely, when you hear your name called, please press star six and you will be uh, unmuted. So let's see, may I please have the sign up sheet for, are there any? There are no in-person commenters signed up. Okay, no in-person commenters, but if anybody would like to be uh, added as you come in, feel free. And we've got one commenter on the remote list. And so I'll go ahead and open it up to remote commenters. And that is, uh, let's see, BJ, no last name. Go ahead, BJ, you've got two minutes. Oh, good morning. My name is BJ. Oh, BJ uh, last. Last actually... Yep. Yeah, Please it looked weird ahead. on the form. Yeah, good morning. My name is BJ Last. I'm a Ballard resident and a small business or a former small business owner at this point. I was calling in actually to give what I found to be the largest barriers to being a new small business owner based on my experience. Uh, largely it was other businesses. Um, big things, those businesses not paying their employees and the city taking a relatively laissez-faire approach to enforcing that through the Office of Labor Standards, where businesses know pretty much if they don't pay, they, you know, at worst, if they get dinged, end up having to pay a portion of what they hadn't paid people. So I was in a position of having to compete with people who weren't actually paying their workers, giving them a sizable advantage over me. So that was a large barrier. Additionally, other issues with board regulations. There are a lot of businesses that have dropped in a bunch of eco blocks. This has taken out parking, limiting people's ability to get to my business without actually putting in anything useful like bike infrastructure or outdoor seating or anything to actually improve access to the area. It's really just removing access. So really those items have been the biggest barriers to me. So thank you, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you very much. Seeing no other speakers listed on the remote sign-up sheet. The co public comment period is now closed. Will the clerk please read item one into the record? Agenda item number one, appointment 02596, appointment of Budi Mulio as member of the Seattle Film Commission for a term to July 23, 2025, briefing discussion and possible vote. Thank you very much. Why don't you come on up to the table while I provide a little bit of context here. So um, this is the final member of the Film Commission uh, position in position 11, representing immersive technology, such as augmented, extended, mixed, and virtual reality and emerging technology businesses. Positions one through 10 were nominated by the mayor and city council and confirmed in April. And per Council Bill 120412, the Film Commission's remaining, uh, that, that is the Film Commission's authorizing legislation, position 11 is to be selected by the seated uh, film commissioners. And they've met a few times and have now uh, put a nominee before us. And, his, uh, and we will hear from Alicia Teal, by the way, welcome, uh, the Office of Economic Direct, uh, Office of Economic Development's new External Affairs Director, and usually we have Chris Swenson, the face of Seattle Film. He is out, so we're lucky to have you in chambers today. 
and I will have everybody else uh, introduce themselves. But thank you so much, Mr. Mulio, for coming today and uh, and being available for us to get to know you a little bit. Go ahead. Oh, uh, by the way, before you start, um, Council Member Herbold has joined us a few minutes ago. Go ahead. Great. Good, good morning, Council Members. Thank you for having us here today. Council Member Nelson, thanks for the warm welcome. Um, at the City of Seattle's Office of Economic Development, we are committed to building an inclusive economy where individuals, businesses, and community can build wealth, share in Seattle's prosperity, and unleash their potential for growth and innovation. One important part of our local economy is the creative economy, representing all jobs that use creative skills and produce creative results across all industries. Today, we celebrate new opportunities within our local film industry, a foundational part of our creative economy. The Seattle Film Commission is a group of 11 film sector volunteer representatives assembled to advise and make recommendations to the city of Seattle on the development of policies and programs that enhance the economic development of Seattle's film industry, provide growth opportunities for local film industry businesses and workers, and promote the sustainable growth of family wage jobs for workers who have been historically underrepresented in the industry. The Seattle Film Com Commission serves as both a conduit to the local film industry and a key thought partner to the city as we collaborate to design policies and programs that grow the local film industry, connect talent to opportunities and jobs, and keep Seattle a premier location for film production. I'm excited for the commission's appointment for position 11 and would like to hand it over to the position six commissioner, Champ N. Sminger, to talk about and introduce the commission selection for this seat. Budi Molyo. We'd be happy to take questions after Champ and Budi introduce themselves. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, Council Member Nesson. Um, I am Champ Ensminger. I represent position six on the commission, which uh, represents the post-production uh, community in Seattle. And um, yeah, as, as far as the uh, connections that we have uh, between uh, Budi and I, as far as the uh, kind of the slice of production that we experience. Um, we are both uh, technologists in that we represent uh, people in the community that are using a lot of uh, em emerging technologies and advancing technologies for the process of production. As an editor myself, uh, it's a lot of um, trying to sort through all the fun that is had at production. Um, and uh, the defining characteristic of uh, uh, the community that Booty represents as far as immerse, immersive technology is that it is production and post-production at the same time. And um, uh, all of the kind of the interesting things that are happening in that space are, are able to happen on their own in kind of a, a vacuum. Um, Seattle is a great place to, to film things, but in the days that uh, Seattle gives us a curveball as far as weather, immersive technology and virtual uh, technology, mixed reality, all of these things can be created um, kind of standalone and uh, doesn't need to rely on fair weather, uh, which is really great for productions. Um, yeah, and so as uh, one of the 10 sitting members of the commission, we are very excited to include this uh, voice in, in, in the commission. Um, through a public nomination and application process back in March, uh, the city received 170 applications for uh, the 11 uh, Seattle Film Commission positions. And uh, positions one through five were selected by the mayor and positions six through 10 were selected by the city council. Uh, and position 11 is selected by the sitting members of the commission. Um, we uh, deliberated thoughtfully and uh, Booty's uh, name came up uh, many times as uh, as someone who is working in the space and uh, and whose uh, past work really aligns with the mission of the commission uh, as it stands now. So um, we're very excited for him to join us. Um, the position seats, uh, as I said, a uh, film industry leader in immersive technology, which includes, uh, but not limited to augmented, extended, mixed, and virtual reality, uh, as well as uh, emerging technology businesses that, the, that surround these, uh, these fields. Um, so this position is selected by the 10 seated members of uh, our commission and has a two year term which will end July 23rd, 2025. Um, I am very excited and honored to introduce uh, Budi Mulio for the 11th position. Thank you. Happy to hear from you. Go ahead. Okay. So thank you so much. For, uh, this is an honor for me to be nominated uh, as the uh, Shell Film Commission. Um, and I'm so excited about this uh, position because of my past experience of 
being an uh, Asian, and it's like really the only way to get uh, ahead is to uh, learn uh, cutting edge technology so that I can actually uh, contribute to the pr film production. It's like, if you probably heard, it's like there's, there's a, uh, something like called Oscar So White. So <laughs> this is part of the thing is like where I get into the film production as well is like 50, uh, a, lo a long time ago when I was like doing this, um, um, it's like I did not get into the, uh, become an actor. So I started with the uh, PA. Uh, and then, then um, eventually, I using I, I leverage my uh, 15 years experience in IT consulting. I, I actually learned more about this uh, virtual reality technology, and um, uh, we do uh, 48 hours events uh, where people come together and then co-create and then uh, share our resources. And then uh, the way we tell story is different from the way we tell story now, uh, which is probably is going to be the future uh, because like uh, how much the uh, corporation in Seattle, like Facebook, Microsoft, and Apple, they're just throwing billions of dollars into this technology already. So they have a lot of right on this technology alone. But in my um, perspective that um, we can't um, forget of the underrepresented and un um, um, you know, the underprivileged that, that actually didn't have access to the technology in the first place, that they were not allowed to be part of this um, emerging technology. So um, I co-founded a nonprofit um, eventually um, to uh, make sure that this has equal opportunity for everyone. So uh, 6R is the name of the uh, nonprofit that I co-founded. Um, and right now, we are actually have two uh, training modules. One is the AI and how it can be incorporated into business. And then the other one is the architecture visualizations. That can be used for, for example, like what you say, is um, uh, building the set but not actual set, but it's the digital set. So that's just like a start of that. Um, I also, I visited uh, Fossler Studio, um, which is in Kirkland, and that was an uh, excellent example on how we can uh, uh, leverage technology into the production. It was like a really good um, way to think about it, just like you can bring in the environment to us instead of us going to the environment. So, um, one thing that I felt um, would be good also, um, I've experienced another VR um, that being used as a mental uh, health uh, care product, where you can actually be exposed to, uh, for example, bullying, but with the um, psychiatrist, some, someone uh, next to you, so to guide you, and some, some of them being used to like um, uh, exposure therapy for like uh, uh, veterans who uh, came back with like the trauma, uh, PTSD and stuff like that. So another one was being used to, um, uh, as a healing process when, uh, for burn victims or like someone with a um, uh, paraplegic. So it has a lot of potential, especially when you start thinking about like this can be used for the um, other than film, basically. But the, um, I also recognize like people who are um, uh, refugees, um, like people who doesn't have a mean to get this. So I was also um, trying to advance that agenda a little bit, like diversity uh, within the film industry as well. Um, so that's kind of like the thing that I, I'm passionate about. And uh, and at the same time, also it has the benefit of. Um, Engage, uh, engaging and leveraging the uh, corporation to be part of the community by um, showing the example of how we can actually uh, um, work together. Yeah. So that's uh, a little bit of what I'm passionate about, and I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm here to for that for, uh, to advise the city. Thank you very much for for telling us what um, basically what this sector is and also uh, its applicability to film. And this is the perfect example of what I've been saying ever all along, which is that film is such encompasses such a broad range of disciplines. And so, you mentioned that you, I think, that you wanted to be an actor, but that didn't quite work out. And so, but here you are in film. This you are. Uh, 
an example of how film is a um, is a crossover industry. That uh, the disciplines that are uh, that are in operation in film are also, of course, um, the the basis for many other sectors and vice versa. So. Um, I really appreciate that bio. I noticed that, um, so can you tell me a little bit more about, did, have you ever studied film or when you said that you, you your love of film? That was a long time ago. Um, I just wanted to note that you also have a passion for cars, it seems, so, um, for for cars in your in your yeah oh, you you uh, look up uh, look me up yes um, I did um, um, work on the autonomous vehicles um, and uh, compete on the um, uh, Seattle Robotics Society uh, competition and won that uh, <laughs> competition um, yeah that was uh, also another passion of mine um, and I started um, um, a company in West Africa at the point like. Um, it's, it's challenging, of obvious, for obvious reasons. Logistically, it's hard to send parts from China to Africa. But that's uh, cars, yes. But um, it's not quite passion for cars, but more passion about fabrication and uh, electronics and electrical. So because I, in, in the long run, this is like an, uh, another thing that I'm juggling too, is uh, uh, building an, uh, a floating island school. I'm, this is like people will be laughing at me whenever like I'm like in the room. Only take five, ten minutes before that comes up. <laughs> it's called aquademy. So it's like we'll be learning uh, sustainability, but I don't know anything about this is a, where a lot of time where I start. Like I don't know anything about it. I don't have resources from network to do it, but let's do it anyway so that I can actually start the momentum going. Um, and I don't know how and when and you know, to build this uh, floating island school. So I just start with like, electronics and fabrication. That's, that's, so that, that's where the car coming from, you know, so. I understand. Yeah. Thank you. So. Uh, uh, let me, I'm looking at my screen here to see if any of my colleagues have any questions or comments. Okay, seeing none. I just want to say that I am delighted and excited about your participation. Uh, because I think that we'll learn a lot from you and that you will be a, a, a great um, contribution to the mission of uh, advancing film and the creative uh, sector in Seattle. So with that, uh, let's uh, go ahead. I will move this legislation. Um, hearing no other questions from committee members, Excuse me, I move that the committee recommends confirmation of appointment 02596. Is there a second? Thank you. It's been moved and seconded to recommend confirmation of the appointment, and I'm not seeing any other. Uh, I'm not seeing other hands up. So, will the clerk please call the roll on the committee recommendation that appointment zero two five nine six be confirmed? Council President Juarez. Aye. Council Member Strauss. Yes. Council Member Herbold. Yes. Chair Nelson. Aye. Four in favor, zero opposed. Thank you very much. The motion carries and the committee recommendation that appointment 02596 be confirmed will be forwarded to the city council uh, for final consideration at council's next meeting on Tuesday, July 18th. And you are welcome to be present either in, in person or online, but you don't need to be there. So thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. Thank Excellent. You so thank you so much. Thank you. All right, will the clerk please call the next item, item two, into the record. Agenda item number two, addressing small business barriers in Seattle. Okay, while we're waiting for a change of guard at the table, you can, you can all come up and, and sit down. I, I just have to say that I'm excited to welcome back a panel of business representatives from across the city. And for the viewing public, if, um, this is the second roundtable discussion that the Economic Development Technology and City Light Committee has hosted. Uh, the first one was in, I think it was February 8th, 2022, shortly after I took office, and it focused on the impacts of, of crime on small businesses. And the question at the time was, why are we looking at crime in, in this committee? And it was because, uh, that, because public safety was a core precondition for economic recovery and growth. 
And I just wanted to invite small business representatives to the table to really talk about the reality behind the statistics and put forward some recommendations for things that the city could do uh, in the in the short term to to really help, and the uh, and it was productive. There were several recommendations that were put forward, and one, for example, that was implemented was the um, storefront repair fund, in which uh, small businesses can apply to um, through the Office of Economic Development for um, up to two thousand dollars to reimburse themselves for um, payments. Uh, that they had to make to repair storefronts, you know, broken doors, windows, et cetera. So that is one example. Um, there's also case conferencing. I won't go into detail about that. But the point is that it does work to bring people with the, um, with the firsthand knowledge to the tables to educate counsel and also advocate for themselves. So um, crime is still an ongoing issue to small business success, but we've invited you all here at your request, I must note, um, to talk about other challenges that small businesses are facing and, uh, and also showcase some of the great work that you all are doing to promote your members and your business districts. So before passing it off to our first speaker, who is Alliance for Pioneer Square Executive Director Lisa Howard, why don't you just all go around the table and introduce yourselves? Um, I'll start. I'm Lisa Howard. I'm the executive director with the Alliance for Pioneer Square. Good morning. Aaron Goodman, executive director for the Soto Business Improvement Area. Good morning. Mike Stewart. I'm executive director for the Ballard Alliance. Hello. I'm Monisha Singh, executive director of the Chinatown International District Business Improvement Area. Morning. My name is Quinn Pham. I'm the executive director with the Friends of Little Saigon. Uh, good morning. Chris Mackay, executive director of the West Seattle Junction Association. Good morning, uh, Don Blakeney, Executive Director of the U District Partnership. Hello, everybody. Go ahead. Thank you for coming. Thank you for giving of your time to be here today. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm going to kick it off. So, good morning, and thank you to Councilmember Nelson and the committee for inviting us here today to discuss the small business barriers in Seattle. A lot has changed over the last year since we presented to your committee, and we're excited to continue to tackle the remaining obstacles with the council as well as the mayor's office. We would like to especially highlight the Office of Economic Development and their continued work with us around supporting our districts and Seattle small businesses. Um, our, our panel, as you can see, consists of representatives from seven districts across Seattle, and we will each take a few minutes to share what's going well, what continues to challenge our small business owners, and then we'll conclude with uh, some recommendations for moving forward. We hope that this discussion will give you a high-level overview of what's happening on the ground and help to inform your decision-making as you continue through 2024. Overall, we see a continued investment in our district through both public and private projects. As we come off of the All-Star Game Week, we also can highlight events that are coming back in full force from the recently from the recent U District Street Fair to the upcoming Ballard Seafood Fest and the West Seattle Summer Fest as well as others. We continue to drive traffic to our neighborhoods with fun and engaging activities for regional visitors. We are welcoming new businesses. Pioneer Square saw an influx of leasing on ground floor retail in Q1 and 2 with 18 new leases signed or businesses opened. And last, we continue to steward our public spaces and commitment to ensure green spaces available to our neighborhood residents, neighborhoods and surrounding residents with the reopening of City Hall Park, the Ballard Commons, and the recent groundbreaking of the Little Saigon Park. Through all of this work, we remain committed to growing our respective books of work around diversity, equity, and inclusion through program improvements, including hiring, operations, and programming. And as things are moving forward, we need the continued support of the city to ensure our city's business districts and small businesses continue to flourish. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. That's an overview of the panelists. Next one. Okay, uh, we're actually gonna start with the University District. Great, happy to kick us off here. Um, thanks for having us here today. I'm Don Blakeney with the University District Partnership. Um, uh, the UDP is a uh, 501c3 nonprofit that is funded mostly by a business improvement area and um, that was renewed in 2020. Uh, and um, right now we're seeing in the U District kind of a, a tale of a few different stories here. We have um, kind of unprecedented investment 
We had the upzone that happened in 2017, which brought a whole new host of investment and a light rail station that opened in 2021. Those two things alone have changed a lot of the shape of the U District. We see a uh, huge investment in housing, especially student housing that's coming through, also some commercial properties that are coming. Um, that is, uh, you know, we're expected to add about 7,000 residents over the next five years, which is going to have a huge impact on the small vitality of the, of the small businesses in our district. Um, we've had some really great partners uh, with the city government and with state government this year. Um, and the last couple of years, the Office of Economic Development has uh, been very helpful in, in working closely with us, uh, first on a grant to help us do some beautification across the neighborhood. We did a whole tree lighting um, initiative that basically brought tree lights uh, all the way from Northeast 41st Street up to 50, Northeast 50th Street, which changed the whole way of the neighborhood field at night. Also, we had uh, a broken windows grant that we piloted that turned into that whole storefront uh, uh, renovation program that uh, the city was leading. It was huge benefit to small business owners who during the pandemic didn't have the resources to keep after the broken windows that were keep coming on a regular basis. The, the big story recently was a $5 million grant we got from the, uh, uh, from the Department of Commerce at the state of Washington to uh, give uh, basically um, recovery grants to small businesses to help invest in their small businesses. A lot of our small businesses have short leases, so it makes it hard for them to make long-term investments in their in their spaces and so this grant unlocked a lot of uh, potential for improvements we have 140 grants across the neighborhood that have made a big impact on our district as Lisa mentioned earlier we did have our event season this spring which is really exciting we had the cherry blossom festival boba fest and the U district street fair which all came in quick succession and were able to kind of bring new people into the district and to really br uh, bring that vitality um, we have public works projects going on and we um, and we have new businesses opening. I wanted to say all that before I said we also have some major issues that we're still trying to deal with. We have a couple of unaddressed drug markets that just hold on on certain parts of our neighborhood that result in, uh, in shootings and in a lot of public safety issues that we've got to go, uh, get after as a city. Also, we have an extreme, uh, an extreme situation with people who are suffering from unaddressed behavioral health issues. And we've been able to work with our city our city partners on a case conferencing program, just like Ballard's doing, and that's been really meaningful because having personalized approaches to these folks who have really high needs is a really is a really important intervention um, in order to make a difference and lower the impact they have in our neighborhood. I'll stop there and uh, and kick it over to um, I believe it's Ballard. Mike. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Terrific. Uh, good morning again, Mike Seward, Ballard Alliance. We are an organization that represents hundreds of businesses in Ballard and also residents as well. But we're here today to talk more uh, about business. Businesses. Um, I'll uh, follow suit here and talk a little bit about what's going really well and then, and then highlight a couple of things that we'd love to be able to work with you all to address. I think the, the first thing, especially coming out of the pandemic, um, Ballard has, has done well. I think um, we've had low turnover of our businesses and the vacancies uh, that we do have seem to fill pretty quickly. It's not, there are certainly a couple of uh, problem spots uh, with some longer term vacancies, but they are more more the exception than the norm, and uh, I'll definitely credit that in large part to the Street Cafe program uh, that we worked on a lot uh, with Councilmember Strauss, Councilmember Nelson, the mayor's office over the last couple of years. Ballard's a thriving uh, restaurant and retail district, and, and to really prop up that restaurant uh, economy during the pandemic to keep those businesses there and thriving through street cafes, I think in large part helped us overall. Uh, and that program continues to grow and evolve. So that is, is definitely a huge positive. I'll echo the storefront uh, repair fund that's been successful uh, and continuing that forward into the future, I think would be a, a great benefit to all neighborhood business districts across the city. Uh, public art projects are flourishing. Uh, in, in Ballard since 2019, we've been able to do uh, not just us, but through other their partnerships uh, with business owners, arts groups, the city, et cetera, over 75,000 square feet of public art in Ballard. So it's been uh, really impressive uh, and, and a great uh, display. And then uh, the other piece, going back to uh, our meeting a little over a year ago, uh, and we talked about the notion of uh, public safety coordinators, safety hub coordinators, um, 
we have city funding that for that position this year and have brought that position on board. Uh, it's been about four months and I, I think it is, it's beginning to make a difference. It takes a little while to onboard, um, but I think the, the most important thing is having that dedicated individual within the district who can liaise with businesses and liaise back with the city or other levels of government uh, on crime related or, or general safety related related issues. Um, not everything can have a perfect solution at the end. However, having that contact and that person that's dedicated to working with that business owner, and remember, these are small businesses that are, um, they're working in their businesses, they're managing staff and payroll and all of those things, and to have to deal with insurance agents and, and uh, SPD reports and follow it all up, it's very challenging. So having that individual uh, to assist with that uh, is indeed comforting and, and is a great support. So uh, we're, we're big supporters of that, and that could be something that could be carried forward into other districts as well. In terms, in terms of barriers, um, I, for us, I think the key barriers really do uh, center around the public safety realm, and I'll just hit just a couple of points. But you know, clearly, repeated victimization of small businesses with property damage and theft. And in this particular instance, I'm not talking about the $100,000 theft. Uh, the, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but just the repeated, you know, uh, break-ins, smash and grabs, thefts, uh, it just, it really becomes time consuming and is, uh, creates, creates kind of this, this sensibility uh, that, that of things being unsafe. And, and, and as a business owner, you're really looking out for the safety of, of your employees and your customers first, and then, and then yourself as well. So those things repeatedly happening continues to be a challenge. At a higher level, organized theft uh, at small and independent businesses, we talk a lot about retail theft and organized retail theft, and when we think about it, we think about major retailers, right, that may be, may be downtown, they may be in the Northgate Corridor or elsewhere, but uh, I do want to mention that that's happening in neighborhood business districts with small businesses. And, and it is, I'll give you an example of how organized it is. There's a small ice cream shop and uh, they have a Brinks uh, security truck that comes every day or every week on a certain day. And there was an individual who clearly staked it out, knew the day that the truck was coming, the day before, broke in, drilled through the safe, and took uh, nearly a bike shop break in uh, with a... I don't know if it was a U-Haul, but it was just a, a big box truck uh, pulled up in the middle of the night, smashed, and took $60,000 worth of bicycles. So those, those things are out there and happening too. And that's, uh, you know, that's a, a little less prevalent, but it's still of concern. And when that impact happens, it's real and it's meaningful. Uh, and then I think uh, the last thing I'll hit on, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleagues, is just thinking about uh, encampments in the public rights of way. And I think that we've had some really good Good improvement um, over the last six months to, to nine months on that. However, problems still do persist. And just one quick example is an alleyway that's uh, between Market Street and 56th. It's behind Majestic Bay Theater. It's a small, narrow alleyway, and it is the access point for all of the compost, recycle, and trash bins for all those small businesses in a small residential building. And we've had some persistent um, uh, encampments there in the right-of-way, which uh, creates a couple of problems is one, the safety and security of the individuals who have to, you know, the employees who are minimum wage or a touch above who have to go out there and, and use those uh, use those dumpsters to do their job and get things done. Um, we've had fires out there, uh, very unclean and, and unsanitary situations. Uh, and, and then uh, really at kind of the peak, we've had waste management who has stopped service for fear of safety of their employees that are out there picking up the waste. We work it day by day. We work it in our case conferencing meetings, um, but that, the, the persistence of that is uh, clearly still an issue that we need to keep doing a better job on. All right, I'm next. Um, okay, so, you know, this year is really themed a tale of two cities, and in our case, a tale of two neighborhoods. Um, we're finding in Pioneer Square, the highs are really high and the lows are very low, and that continues on, and looking to make some more progress in that in 2023 and 2024. 
Um, I think one of the, uh, the best stories about Pioneer Square is people are coming back. As I mentioned in my opening, we have a number of new businesses, 18 since the beginning of the year, and many of those are Asian, black, and women owned. Um, and it's really exciting to see a new group of people investing in the district and, and planting roots there. Uh, we were the recipient of an RCO grant through the state of Washington for the for a redesign project for Pioneer Park. So looking forward to kicking that work off to be able to improve one of our major gateways to the neighborhood. And it's such an important space. Uh, this year, we also had the reopening of City Hall Park. Uh, we continue to work to ensure a safe, inviting urban realm. There's a lot of work to do up there, especially to ensure that the 600 plus residents on the adjacent blocks have everything they need to be able to live a, a quality, safe life in our city. Um, and private and public investments continue. People continue to bet on Pioneer Square. We have six developments um, either slated or underway, as well as a number of public investments coming in to do improvements on street, street improvement projects and other projects. Uh, and the last highlight, I will say we finally have the Pioneer Square Habitat Beach is open. If you haven't been down there, please take a second and walk down. It's such a um, unique opportunity to be able to actually touch the water from Pioneer Square and, and really shows the progress that we've made as a city and um, kind of the future of our connection to the waterfront and the importance of that project for Seattle as a whole. Uh, moving on to barriers, um, I think the main, the main one, and this is something that we're really focusing on, is neighborhood occupancy continues to be a challenge. Recent reports show our vacancy rate is one of the highest in the city at 25%, uh, which is back to about 2008, 2009 levels. Um, there's many factors for this. It's some of it's pandem pandemic related, some of it's redevelopment. So it's a it's a combination of things that are that are leading to that level of vacancy rates, um, as well as the leases being in flux post pandemic. You know, a lot of people has lease terms of five to eight years, so we're not done seeing kind of that 20. 2020 impact. Can you as repeat it, your vacancy rate? Uh, 25%. Okay, thank you. Um, so we will continue to see that uh, over the next couple of years as people decide what they're going to do with those lease assigned um, pre and during the early days of the pandemic. Uh, next, really exciting with East West Connections coming online, but we will have construction impacts this fall across the district, uh, which will make accessibility and operations even more challenging. Um, one of the other large things that we're hearing from businesses permitting challenges uh, for small business, including a lack of clarity and confusion within the system, as well as delays, um, especially once that starts delaying opening dates, you're talking about a lot of money for a very small business investing their life savings into, into trying to open and invest in the city. Uh, next one is infrastructure challenges. Uh, we have areaways issues, which are becoming more impactful to the day-to-day -day operations. We've had a couple areaway failures, which both impact the public realm and accessibility from a pedestrian standpoint, but also um, have long-term high cost implications for the neighborhood as a whole, as well related to infrastructure, transportation planning. We're really looking for connectivity and accessibility for to our transit system for Pioneer Square. I don't feel like we're quite there yet with the, the current planning and, and where we, we've ended up after the multiple years of construction impacts on the district. Uh, last but not least, uh, looping back to a theme Mike just uh, brought up is criminal activity, including property crime. We did a recent survey asking businesses uh, about their experience in the district over the last year, and we found a group of 40 businesses reported about $221,000 in damage collective due to property damage, and that's a direct impact on their bottom line and looking for ways to be able to help um, those businesses survive as well as lessen that impact. And I'm going to pass it over to Manisha with the Chinatown International BIA, District BIA. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Monisha Singh with the Chinatown ID BIA. Um, we're all a uh, smaller, smaller BIA um, covering what we consider west of I-5, including Chinatown and Japantown. Um, some of the things to highlight that are going well is um, summer in Seattle is so dynamic and we're seeing a lot of great activities in the CID. Um, so we've been invested in 
doing consistent marketing activities over um, over the summer, and a lot of our smaller neighborhood events are coming back. Um, this is really highlighted with our activations, including our CID food walk, where we're finding that consistent effort over a longer period of time has been more impactful to our businesses as opposed to doing our larger events. Uh, we've also seen, um, especially since the pandemic, a very strong volunteer base that is um, supporting us in our neighborhood. Um, we learned, especially at the height of the pandemic, um, people's really emotional connection to the CID is very strong. And a lot of folks consider this their um, cultural home. And so we're seeing a lot of volunteer engagement. Uh, we do neighborhood cleaning events monthly. We've done um, our large spring clean this year and the One Seattle Day of Service and had a lot of engagement um, with volunteers. And we're continuing to see that um, the rest of this year and into the years uh, ahead. Um, and it has been um, really beneficial to our small BIA to have that volunteer support to help the beautification of the neighborhood because we are not able to necessarily cover all of those bases with our cleaning contracts. Um, some other exciting things, uh, we're seeing several new businesses. Um, similar to Ballard, we actually, um, our turnover rate um, was pretty pretty high at the height of the pandemic, but we we're seeing a lot of backfill really quickly. Um, so it's really exciting to see some new neighborhood businesses or some new businesses in the neighborhood and just over the last several months. Um, and through our support, through partnership with uh, the Office of Economic Development, we've had two really exciting projects over the last um, almost two years now. Um, one is what we call the window repair project. Um, we have now supported over 100 businesses in providing um, security film to be placed on top of their windows to prevent future break-ins. Um, in addition to that, we've been able to provide um, window repairs uh, for broken windows over the last um, year or so for free to our businesses. Um, our office in particular is doing a what we are calling a pressure washing project as part of this. Um, we have been able to pressure wash almost the entirety of the district um, last year, last summer, and then we paused for the winter season and we're picking that back up this summer. So this is um, our effort to get the neighborhood to a baseline level of cleanliness as it was prior to the pandemic. And it's been um, really great to see this clear and visible improvement. Um, so highlighting some of our barriers that we're experiencing, <clears throat> as other folks have mentioned, we're still continuing to see some public safety issues, particularly around property damage and graffiti, broken windows and doors and fires. Um, being a historic district, a lot of these costs to our businesses and to our BIA is very cost prohibitive. Um, to repair a window in a historic district is very challenging, not just from the cost, but a lot of our businesses are not insured or underinsured, plus going through the historic review process to um, get that back up is uh, quite, quite a process. Um, in addition to that, we're still seeing some solid waste management issues. Um, the CID is home to one of several business districts that has the Clear Alley program. Uh, the Clear Alley program was um, implemented in the early 2000s to support um, more public safety measures in our service alleys. And with that, um, that removed uh, dumpsters from our, from our uh, alleys and replaced them with uh, bag services that was uh, intended to be cleared more frequently. Um, over the last several years, we've seen a different shift in um, service service levels, but I think we've gotten back to what it was prior to the pandemic. However, the program as a whole is uh, very prohibitive for our businesses to participate in. It is very expensive for businesses to, um, to have a monthly payment plus the cost of bags, plus um, understands the rule, understand the rules and regulations of um, having this program. Uh, one of the other major barriers to this program being successful is the um, the residential population that is in the CID and that is adjacent to our alleys. A lot of our uh, residential buildings are low income buildings and the uh, the pressure that is on residents themselves to participate in this bag program um, is very cost prohibitive and they're not able to participate. 
And so as a large and dense restaurant district, we are seeing a lot of trash generated, but not a good um, avenue for folks in the neighborhood to get rid of their trash. So we're consistently seeing large trash issues in our alleys, in our public cans, and that puts a lot of pressure on our business, on our BIA to um, service um, our public areas and uh, for our businesses to actually participate and make this program successful. Um, another area that we're seeing um, some challenges in is our events. Um, so our BIA is reassessing what events look like for our district. Um, we've historically done three large uh, festivals and um, we're finding from our businesses that they're not necessarily complementary to their business or helping their business. Um, and unfortunately, they're not able to participate in a lot of our events because of the um, permitting issues with um, either um, SOT permitting or coming out into the street to fend food. Um, so it hasn't been something that they have really able to been a part of, and it's uh, hasn't, they haven't been able to reap the benefits of either. Um, and then our other large issue is around sound transit and the future uh, station in or around the CID and future construction impacts related to that, uh, to that station location. So with that, I'll pass it off to uh, Quinn, uh, Friends of Little Saigon. Yes, um, uh, Quinn, I'm with the Friends of Little Saigon. And um, as you can tell, uh, there's two of us here from the CID. So Little Saigon is included in the Chinatown International District, but we're not included in the BIA assessment. And so the Friends of Little Saigon, uh, we fill in some of the gaps uh, that are present because we don't have a BIA, but hope to in the future with your support. <laughs> um, so as Manisha has mentioned, uh, with our events, uh, because of our small capacity, uh, smaller curated cultural events have been really successful um, in the neighborhood. And we want to continue to do that with our partners. Um, things like Celebrate Little Saigon, which is a small block party in the neighborhood. And then we work with local um, artists and authors to do book readings and smaller events that are really tailored to the needs of um, our community members. And those are, have been fantastic. And we hope to do more of those in the future. Um, but I want to speak on more of the infrastructure that is in Little Saigon. We, because the neighborhood um, has multiple challenges being fairly younger than the rest of the Chinatown core. Um, our infrastructure is not um, built to sustain or um, really support long-term businesses and economic activity. And so um, I think Lisa has mentioned that they have uh, seven developments happening in the Pioneer Square area. We have seven just on the east side of um, the Chinatown courts in Little Saigon, um, maybe more. And so this neighborhood is drastically changing and you'll see that visibly in the next couple of years. Um, and so on our part, we are working really closely with the Office of Economic Development on Small Business TA and other support programs that have been mentioned today. Um, they've been part of our um, collaboration to really build out uh, support services that are wraparound for businesses. So um, when we say business TA and support, it's not just about the technical like business planning, but it's addressing public safety, um, thinking about succession planning and filling vacancies that have been around for a very long time. Um, but some other good news that is happening in the neighborhood, uh, you heard that we just broke ground on a Little Saigon Park that was underway for over 10 years, which is a little ridiculous, <laughs> but we're really excited for that to happen. Um, that brings on opportunities for more uh, events in the neighborhood, just public open space for employees and uh, residents to come and gather and hang out outside. Um, we also are working with SDOT on several public um, improvements and art in the neighborhood. So we have seven electrical boxes that are being designed and wrapped um, that are coming live this fall. Um, we also have um, small improvements like tree pits, uh, getting the, what is it? Flexies. Flexies something um, so that it's easy to uh, clean up and maintain. Um, and so that those are like simple things that will we hope to see dramatic impacts from. Um, uh, other things are uh, 
uh, working with the uh, Office of Planning and Community Development, um, I'm a huge advocate for the EDI program because it looks at community ownership and uh, small business ownership, um, especially in a neighborhood that has uh, little to no control of uh, their uh, business spaces and the, the changeover and the redevelopment that's happening. Businesses feel like they just don't know what to do um, and where to invest their time and money. And so uh, programs like this can help us uh, secure their position and um, create more opportunities for building legacy businesses that we, we have currently, but are um, slowly vanishing um, in Seattle. So some of the challenges, um, I won't talk too much about this because Manisha talked some, a lot about some of those, but uh, for Little Saigon, it's definitely around public safety. I think Don mentioned this in the U District around black markets and um, drug markets. That is still alive um, in Little Saigon. It continues to move around the district. We hear a lot about 12th and Jackson, but it really is um, not just 12th and Jackson. It constantly moves uh, because there have been only short-term solutions to some of those um, challenges that we're dealing with. Um, and uh, I also want to applaud uh, Ballard for the, the hub coordinator program. So we're also looking at a potential program like that um, or something similar to um, the ambassador programs in other neighborhoods. Um, and lastly, with some of the redevelopments that are happening, um, there's a uh, there could be more to be done with some of our permitting and um, engagement processes with new developers. I think there is an intent in the beginning to work with community, but um, when it actually pans out, um, we're definitely pushed to the side. Um, and the ground floor uses is really a critical part of some of these new developments that we've provided a lot of input and um, uh, uh, strategies uh, forth to the developers, but oftentimes um, it falls flat and we're seeing um, increased vacancies in even our new developments. Um, so that's something that we constantly are thinking about. So I'll pass it to Eric Soto. Thank you, Quinn. Good uh, uh, I do want to note morning. that uh, Council Member Sawant has joined the meeting. Oh, thank you. So I'm Erin Goodman. I represent Soto BIA, which is, Soto is a large district. We uh, encompass nearly 1,200 businesses, over 950 acres, stretching from the stadiums all the way down into the Georgetown area, right north of Georgetown. And Soto had a very different experience during the pandemic than many other neighborhoods is that so many of our businesses were essential and so many of our workers did not have the privilege of working from home. They had to be there every day so the rest of the city could have food and PPE and you know everything moving around. And so what we see, you know, and what was going well in Soto right now is we're very excited. In the last week, we have launched uh, our clean team, which is our cleaning ambassador program. This is something that we are so excited about. We received funds through the city, through federal funds to launch this. And so now we have uh, pressure washing uh, added to our other uh, cleaning services, such as illegal dumping removal and sidewalk cleaning and street sweeping. And so this is going to allow us to be more nimble and to respond to smaller things that are really impactful. So we have teams that do sidewalk cleaning, but that's for big stuff or illegal dumping on demand. But for, for calls of human waste, we've never been able to respond because it was small to the contractor, but huge to the business that's impacted. And so we're really excited for that launch. And I will tell you that the response has been overwhelming. Uh, the clean team came in the second day with a huge box of donuts. They said that they're <laughs> literally like people are trying to feed them as they work because they're so <laughs> excited to have them in the neighborhood. Um, other part that's really exciting is that thanks to a grant from OED, we have launched a green space planning process. Um, we had our first meeting and uh, back in May and are looking to uh, for our next meeting in August to go into a community plan. And really this is 
We know that Soto is under treed. We have about 3% tree canopy, which is very low. Um, and we also know that there are opportunities to add green space in less traditional manners through green walls, through green roofs, through small spaces, as well as large spaces. We have some large areas that are grass in Soto that could have a walking trail or could have you know, additional trees added. Um, but we also wanna make sure that the plan takes into consideration Soto needs and preferences. And so trying to figure out what types of trees grow well in an area where you have a lot of traffic. So columnar trees that grow up rather than out. And so this is hopefully going to will be a plan that when we look towards the future for implementation for grants, we'll have this in place for people to refer to and also will help guide our personal focus on green space in the coming years. Um, another thing that we've done this year that I've been really excited about is that we brought together a group in Soto that we call our economic development stakeholder group. And you know, Soto BIA, we do a lot of advocacy, but it's not what the Soto BIA thinks. We're channeling what we hear from our businesses. And so when we started this group, we kind of had a preconceived notion of what we would hear. What were the biggest barriers to starting a business, to owning a business in Soto? And while we did hear some of the things we expected to hear, like public safety, we also heard a lot about infrastructure, about electric infrastructure, sewer infrastructure, road infrastructure. And we also heard about permitting. And so we partnered again with the Office of Economic Development to do a series of roundtables where we had the first one included uh, the, uh, Deborah Smith from, C, uh, from City Light, uh, Rico from uh, OPCD, and uh, Mark McIntyre, the director of OED, sitting together to hear firsthand from our businesses and property owners, what were the challenges around electric infrastructure, which may, some of you may not realize, but we're at a point when we're electrifying and I'm not sure our grid can keep up because we've had some significant failures this year, um, both planned outages, unplanned outages. We've had businesses waiting up to two years for new electricity or permits that were pulled for electricity, but and then wasn't electrified in time, which allowed someone to come in and steal all the wiring because it wasn't electrified. We've had, you know, so that was really, while we didn't solve all of the problems in that meeting, we developed really good lines of communication that have been significant improvement in this year. We had a power outage where um, earlier before this meeting, where UPS without, without power for almost 24 hours. And, you know, that's different than a regular business. That means packages aren't going out. And after this meeting, uh, Seattle City Light went to UPS, got to understand their operations, where the issues are. And we had another planned outage where that communication, you know, connection was made. And so it was much less impactful to the to UPS as well as to the neighborhood as whole. We did a similar meeting with the directors of SPU, SDCI, and again, OED to talk about uh, the permitting challenges. And permitting is not just about new buildings and bringing in new development. It's also about addressing issues from the past. And there are areas of SOTO that have long chemical and biological issues in terms of hazardous materials. And, you know, we, one property owner shared the frustration of going through the insurance process to get, um, to get their permit to remove a 1950s era chromium dip tank, which I'm not really sure what that is, but it sounds really bad. <laughs> and so they're prepared, they're funded to do it, but they've been waiting over two years for the demolition permit for the corrugated metal shack that sits above it. And so these were kind of the issues. <laughs> I just said noted, go on, sorry. Yeah, and so, you know, once again, we did not solve all of the permitting issues during this meeting, but we developed lines of communication and an opportunity. So now we have access to a permit navigator. So when new businesses or folks come in, 
you know, permitting is still going to take a long time, but we have the ability to route people to someone that can help them make sense of the progress. And we have new development coming in. We have the Tutabella Food Innovation Center, which it will, uh, when it opens at very soon, will employ over 190 people in a food manufacturing facility. We have a new clean energy manufacturing site that's underway. And so there is exciting new stuff coming to Soto. So in talking about what's going well, I also I pretty much address some of our big barriers around infrastructure and, um, and permitting, but I do want to address insurance. Um, we brought this up when we came to speak to you last year, and we understand that insurance isn't something the city of council controls or manages, but I think it's very important that the city begin to understand the impact that some of the, the events and public safety issues and some of the decisions that this body makes have on the ability for businesses to get insurance and also for the cost of that insurance. And we all have anecdotal stories. The business that tells me that pre-pandemic, they could have their choice between 10 to 15 companies, and now they're choosing between three. The fact that they're now their they're deductible is 30,000. That means this business is eating any damage under 30,000. And when you have trucks that get vandalized on a regular basis and maybe they're getting $300 worth of fuel, but it's $8,000 to repair the truck and a truck that's out of commission for a number of days to weeks because the line at the truck repair shop is very long. That means impact to the business. That also means impact to employees when there isn't a truck to drive, if you're not pulling in those employees. And so when you look at that, this cost is both to the property and to the business, but also to the economy as a whole and the ability businesses can't operate without insurance. And so the, ha the ability to get and maintain affordable commercial insurance that really supports a business is really important. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, and over in West Seattle, we're still thrilled about the bridge. <laughs> we are. Every time I drive across it, I smile. Um, so I want to start on the good note as well. Um, in West Seattle, we do love our festivals. We throw about 24 a year, uh, different events and fun things. And um, we just had our first ever Pride Fest last month, which was incredible, well attended, and brought a lot of people into the junction. Um, Summerfest is this weekend, competing with Seafood Fest over in Ballard. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, <laughs> we have better music. Um, just kidding. Um, but uh, we're bringing back a few things just to bring more people in as well. So we're um, also starting some new things like our uh, glass float hunt. We're hiding 100 beautiful glass floats all over West Seattle so people from all over the city can come and find them. Um, we are also doing something new. I've created an uh, artificial intelligence community generated light show that we're going to do on a seven story building at Christmas. Um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. It's new. I'm excited about it. Um, also on uh, the good front, we only have three vacant buildings right now. And I really feel in a lot of ways it's it do with anybody not wanting to come in. It's, it's, it's other than that. So I think I'm happy about that. Um, I also want to thank the city for the broken window fund because like everybody else, my businesses are taking advantage of that and it certainly takes the sting out of a broken window. We had three this week. Um, we do rely a lot on grants from OED, from um, the Neighborhood Matching Fund, from the Office of Arts and Culture, and they help make my job easier just bringing around events and beautification. So I'm really grateful for all that. Um, we experience the same negative issues everybody else is in terms of public safety. And I think one of the big ones is just the persistence of individuals who are challenged mentally or with substance abuse and who refuse service. And uh, then they just hang out in our pocket park and make things very difficult. But in addition to that, I just wanted to touch on permitting because I hear about that the most from business owners. I just met with Todd Carden, who owns Elliott Bay Brewery, just two days ago. He said, uh, Chris, I applied on February 1st for my street cafe permit. I just got it three days ago. 
So that's that's a lot of wait time there. And that's um, incredibly frustrating for them. I've heard countless um, frustrations with the Liquor Control Board and permitting there and very, very challenging. Um, but we did. I did have a person lined up today, Bea and Mark from Next to Nature. It's a small business in West Seattle, and they're trying to open a place called The Hydrant. She wanted to speak today, but um, for some reason had a little bit of difficulty getting on, so she just shot me over something that I'd like to read to you. She says, for background, the space at 4541 California, The Hydrant, was converted to restaurant use in 88, originally Snubby's Deli. There was a series of successor restaurants and cafes. Um, let's see, the butchery took over the space and altered use to mix retail restaurant. We took over in 2015, expecting to be able to continue the restaurant assembly usage. Unbeknownst to us, SDCI, then DCLU, retired the mixed retail restaurant classification and moved the space into full retail so that when we applied to permit for the hydrant, they told us we were changing use and needed to do significant alterations to the facility, including adding a sprinkler system, fire resistant walls. All of prior mentioned businesses had a full size grill hood um, and other kitchen things. She said, we have only refrigeration and we will do no food prep on site. We've been trying to resolve this ever since. She says, our talking points are, we're frustrated with seemingly arbitrary and faceless decisions with no recourse. We are frustrated with the bureaucracy and lack of a single point of contact for communications and escalations. We're being priced out by improvements requested by the city. And um, I'm sure I'm not the only um, BIA director hearing those kinds of complaints, but um, permitting is really challenging. And what I always hear from city officials is we are business friendly. It doesn't feel like that to the businesses. Thank you very much. Well, um, thank you all for sharing your perspectives and stories from the individual uh, districts. I would like to do a quick summary just uh, and then open it up for a discussion with the council member. Again, thank you, council member Nelson for having us here today. I feel weird kind of reading this way, but I'm sure the digital it all works on, on, on the, in Hollywood. Um, <laughs> as a theme, uh, I just wanna bring out three themes I heard as I heard our colleagues talk today. Um, one that, you know, uh, Seed funding in neighborhoods has a huge impact to unlock momentum and prosperity. So just thinking about how the city can play a role with seed funding, that, that Broken Windows grant was a great example of that. Some of the other OED grants have been really important and the Washington State one I mentioned earlier has had a huge impact. Um, public safety is key to prosperity in small business districts. Um, without that, everything else gets way harder. And then I would say a well-organized set of government partners is key to our success. And we've heard some success stories around the table, and I think we've found some success in talking with you, Council Member Nelson, so we wanted to kind of build on that today. Um, I'm, I'm gonna read through a couple of needs that we kind of identified together as a group, um, and then I'll talk about some solutions that we've, uh, we uh, have for those needs. One is, there needs to be a greater safety presence in neighborhoods. And, and that you know used to be police foot patrols, but that's been gone for over a decade now. And so we're trying to figure out what that could look like. Some neighborhoods like the U District and downtown Seattle have ambassadors, and maybe those are programs we could extend into other neighborhoods so that they have that presence. What we find is that there's businesses who need not a 911 call, but someone there to help um, with a very small issue, but if, but if you're sitting in a small business by yourself and you're there and there's somebody who's intimidating you, it's not a 911 call. It could be a, someone else is coming in and asking them, hey, can you step away or um, answer some questions about something that might be happening outside that you might not understand, but the safety ambassador does. So those kind of solutions, we'd like to see those in other neighborhoods. We brought this forward as an idea in 2021 when we came to this committee as an unarmed civilian foot patrol. That hasn't been realized, so we like to put it back on the table and kind of figure out how we can do that in neighborhoods because it is meaningful and it's not necessarily um, you know, a 911 call. So, And I'll, one last thing on that, it, they can work very closely and do in the U District with social service providers to identify need and then help triage places where the unaddressed behavioral health is having a huge impact. So that, there's a great partnership there that can be realized if we, if we do it right. Second need um, is the insurance issue. Uh, Aaron brought up that issue. Uh, very, uh, it's very important to small businesses to be able to get insurance. It unlocks other things they need to be doing as a small business. And so those barriers need to be better understood. We're not experts in insurance. And um, so we can't translate these anecdotal stories into what should be done. I think what we asked for back when we came in 2021 was the 
was an idea of a study, either at the state level or at the city level, to really unlock kind of what's going on there and what could be done to have insurance be less expensive and more available. Um, the perceptions of Seattle, it just, uh, we're being told it's high risk, and so um, insurance is not easy to get and it's expensive. Um, another need that we have is uh, so better solid waste management. We heard in the CID about the issues they're having with uh, waste management. Um, not the company necessarily, but just the idea of, of managing so much solid waste. Um, to put it in context, we have a handful of neighborhoods in Seattle that have both historic buildings and high concentrations of restaurants. What that means is, you know, with a new building, you have a garbage is required to be stored inside. So all of the dumpsters come inside and you have alleys that are open and you can use them for other things. In neighborhoods like CID, or in the U District, we have, for example, in the U District, we have 130 restaurants within 10 blocks, and all of that garbage gets stored outside on a regular basis. And there's the, the oversight of that garbage depends, depends on, it, it gets really wonky really quick, but like residential is a different process than commercial, and the oversight is different. Um, and so that just leaves a whole bunch of room for slippage. We had 40 dumpster fires up against buildings in one year in the U District because someone was coming through and lighting dumpsters on fire that were not locked, um, and it caused... We, we almost lost a couple of buildings, residential buildings. And um, so having a process to study and kind of understand these issues, maybe having a team that comes by and helps deal with all of the overflowing dumpsters that happen. We have a lot of um, illegal dumping that comes when you have that concentration of dumpsters. People from all over the region know they can come to a certain neighborhood and dump their stuff and no one will know and no one will care. We find, re we find uh, receipts and, and kind of like box labels from Kirkland. People come and just use it because they know it's a target and there's no real way to deal with it. So perhaps there's a way that we could have um, something built into the city contract with waste providers to come and have an extra team that just comes and helps deal with these few neighborhoods that have this issue. This probably will resolve in the next 100 years when buildings change and things develop, but right now we're, we're stuck with this for the next 50 years. Um, I would also say that uh, the permitting times was brought up here as a really big as a really big issue. I think looking at that as a city and, and doing a study to figure out how we can create a portal for small businesses at the city uh, to address these and handhold people through. It's such a learning curve when you have a new business that's opening up and the permits, it's, it's like the, if you don't understand it all at the front end, you can really delay yourself by accident. And so having someone who can really walk you through that process and all the information you need to have up at the front end of the, at the process is really important. So that's where the city partners come in. We have a great partner with OED and so I don't want to say that that's not there. I think we just need to continue to think about it. And it's interdepartmental. It's not just OED, it's DCI, it's Liquor Control Board, it's these other things that all have to fall in place in a really quick succession for you to get your business open and, and working on time. Um, I think lastly, I just wanted to give a, a kind of a, a I wanted to raise this again as an issue um, that we're all seeing in our neighborhoods. The public safety issues are not a one department issue. They're complex, they require, uh, they re require issue resolution across departments. And I'll use not a U District example, but a Capitol Hill example. Callenderson Park has a lot of public safety issues and we've been working, I live on Capitol Hill. Um, we've been working with the city there to address public safety issues around the park. And what we found is it requires five city departments to deal with a public safety issue. SPU owns a lot of the, the stuff up there. SDOT has a lot of real estate up there. Seattle Parks Department has real estate up there. SPD is involved. The community, uh, the Seattle Central College is involved. And um, of course the Parks Department and all of that comes together. And then you have an HSD layer with the social service providing up there. And, and it, to have a strong partner within the mayor's office and in the city to be able to navigate and quarterback that conversation, super important and we really appreciate all the work that's going on with the Herald administration to try to set up those conversations when we have to do the, uh, that kind of complex issue resolution. But, um, but it's really important that the city steps in and plays that role for business districts like ours where, where not everything's just a quick phone call to a particular agency. You really do need to have that triage. I'm gonna leave it there. Did I capture everything? Is there anything I, I missed from you all? I think you did. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. Well, that's quite a to-do list. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting Thank caught you. up here. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to start by saying uh, to remind our, um, our listeners and our viewers on Not Hollywood, the award-winning Seattle channel, um, <laughs> what is a BIA? Bus business improvement areas are funding mechanisms for business district revitalization and management. And so local stakeholders, usually property owners, um, oversee and fund the maintenance, improvement, and promotion of their commercial district. And, their, um, and we just uh, renewed the MID. That is an example of a, of a business improvement uh, area. And they are intended to provide supplemental services to, 
to ensure the success of the businesses that um, that are located in neighborhood business districts, also uh, residents, et cetera. And um, what we're hearing and what we I've said before is that these aren't supplemental services. These are essential services that if, we're, if they were not provided by uh, the BIAs, our city would be quite different. So um, thank you again for that. And I just wanted to make sure that people understood what we're talking about when we say BIA. And there are 11 in the city. So um, next time I will, uh, at next meeting, I, I want to say that I'm hearing a lot about, I'm just responding to some major themes. Um, I am hearing about coordination in that businesses, uh, not just individual businesses, but BIAs themselves would like to have uh, a, um, a cross-departmental response of some sort because problems are not uh, simple usually and I in back of the day OED did have a an informal team called the BAT team which uh, um, basically were uh, go-to people in departments that a business owner could a business owner makes one call to OED and then uh, and if there's a combination city light s dot problem then uh, that person would help navigate um, the, the communication across departments. And the good news is that the, uh, the OED is working on revamping and formalizing that, and we will hear about that at our next meeting. So I do have some good news on that front, that there will be a lot of what, you, the needs that you're talking about for um, uh, streamline problem solving, uh, in essence, will, uh, is being addressed, and I look forward to hearing more details about that. So I will stop talking now. I heard the needs, and um, before we uh, end this meeting, I want to make sure that my list is correct. But uh, first of all, I would like to open it up to my colleagues for any questions they might have or comments. Sure. Oh, hey. Sorry. Um, Madam Chair, I just want to thank the, um, sorry, I'm having a computer problem, so. I wanted to thank the um, the panel. I know this was the second time we've done this to have small businesses. And um, I know the people from the ID and Soto and Find Your Square, we get a lot of your um, constituent letters and concerns and we've been paying attention to this. So I wanna thank that we have, thank the chair, but also the opportunity to hear from the businesses that are downtown, uh, what we're trying to do um, and hopefully we can do more. Obviously, small businesses are the, you know, they're the lifeblood of what of what makes a community and a city healthy. And they just what they do in any community um, is so important. So I just want to thank you for the opportunity and thank you for being here this morning. And thank you, Chair, for your leadership on this. Thank you very much for recognizing the importance. And um, in previous meetings, you have noted that North Seattle could uh, could Use the BIA. Sorry, Phillips. It anyway. Go ahead, Councilmember Herbal. Uh, thanks so much. I just wanted to um, say a few words on the public safety front um, for folks' awareness. Um, Councilmember Lewis and I, <clears throat> at the beginning of um, 2023, uh, worked with the Seattle Auditor to request an organized retail <clears throat> theft audit. Excuse me. <clears throat> the transmission and uh, completion of that audit um, was delayed. We, um, the auditor had received feedback from several external bodies, including the state attorney general, the King County prosecutor, Homeland Security, uh, and several business groups. Um, feedback uh, as of when we had originally scheduled it for a committee briefing had not yet been been received from executive branch departments. I believe the city auditor has received that feedback um, and are still waiting for a final comment from the executive. We are aiming to have a briefing uh, at the next committee meeting, uh, the Public Safety and Human Services Committee meeting in um, uh, July on the 25th at 9.30. And um, we are including uh, several exter external stakeholders, governmental uh, uh, stakeholders that I mentioned um, earlier, the Attorney General, King County Prosecutor, Homeland Security, but also um, the Washington Retail Association will be joining us as well. Um, I also wanted to 
lift up the fact that Councilmember Nelson and I are um, still seeking an update uh, from uh, the executive on the Seattle Police Department's uh, recruitment and retention plan and the use of uh, funds that the council provided not only in 2022, uh, but also in the 2023 budget uh, for a uh, recruitment and retention plan for the Seattle Police Department. Um, and as soon as we learn more about that plan and the use of the funds that the council provided, um, I will be pushing that information out. And then lastly, um, just want to uh, uh, extend uh, an offer um, to the um, District 1 small business owner who is having uh, problems with the um, permits at SDCI. And if there's anything I can do, uh, feel free to send them my way. I'm happy to try my best. Uh, no promises, but try, try my best to do some troubleshooting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Herbold, and also thank you very much for um, for mentioning our um, our eagerness to hear more about police um, officer recruitment. Because what I'm hearing from everybody here is public safety is an issue. Yes, but I I believe that what you're um, what I heard uh, what I heard that is a benefit of neighborhood ambassadors or the case conferencing is that there are relationships that are being built. <clears throat> Um, through the familiarity of some of these programs that you touched on. And that is what an adequately staffed police department does provide, is the, is the beat cop or the, the regular presence that just gets to know each other, um, you know, people in the district and, and can um, build trust and also um, prevent things from escalating into major district-wide problems. So noted and we'll, you know, looking forward to that update. Councilmember Strauss. Chair, thank you. I, I just have to first say thank you. It's great to see you all, uh, and thank you for your partnership. I was taking notes through all your presentations, so I'll kind of tick through them. They're not in an organized fashion because I think everyone kind of touched on some of the similar points. Um, but I really see everyone here as a partner, and this work, it's an ecosystem of partnership, and a lot of the work that you do is actually government relations. I recall a walk, a public safety walk with Mike Stewart, where we were with SDCI most importantly, but with also with the fire department and the police department, because we were just trying to figure out what can a parking garage do to secure their building. And it was really wonderful to see Mike in a public or in a government relations role, translating and advocating for a property owner who doesn't understand department speak. And Mike and I, our relationship being able to coordinate on the ground right in real time and working with departments. Uh, that type of government relations is not something that comes naturally to small business owners who are focusing on just getting, meeting their bottom line and creating their product and, and moving forward. And um, some of that partnership also looks like the, with the street cafe that we have at Ballard Avenue, SDOT did the work and uh, Ballard Alliance is uh, maintaining those planters. It's, it's important. The public safety coordinator position that we've funded and now hired in Ballard is, I think, very important. And that's, when I'm talking about ecosystem, we took that idea from the U District BIA, right? And uh, it's something, I think that position is something that is needed across all neighborhoods, frankly, because it really is uh, both triage, dispatch, problem solving, and quick wins. Getting nods around the that... table to that. Just say again. Oh, I just said nods around the table just for people that. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and you know, even downtown, Third Avenue, Third and Pike could use somebody just specifically with this role of taking the day-to-day -day issues, triaging, and finding solutions. Um, some of what we've done this last year was taking advice from you last year. I mean, it was last year's presentation where you're talking about hub safety coordinators. We did it in Ballard. We're finding success. I'm happy. I'm going to eventually get back to your asks, but I think that they're spot on. Um, just what Mike said about organized criminal activity, I can confirm that, that it is a different level than the smash and grabs. I won't go into the stories that I've heard, but they are similar to what Mike shared. Um, and some of this partnership is also about dealing with the persistence. 
right? Things get better and then they get worse and then they get better and then they get worse. And the alleyway that Mike brought up, I mean, that thing has been good, it's been bad, it's been good, it's been bad. I mean, I, and I think that it might be time that we look back at some of those earlier solutions that we thought, well, maybe we don't need to do this because, you know, it's, it's been handled, but now it comes back, right? And um, just the ability to work with Mike, to work with SPU to get that trash service return, to work with HSD, um, that partnership is important, especially around persistent issues. Um, there are things that we have done on the legislative side that maybe don't always, like they don't, they're not an immediate felt impact. Um, just this week we passed a Pioneer Square rooftops legislation to hopefully get some more, to reduce the vacancy rate down in Pioneer Square. I mean, I was down in Occidental Square having lunch the other day and it was fabulous. It, was, it reminded me of pre-pandemic after Weyerhaeuser came in. And um, some of this partnership too is going around the table where pre-pandemic I worked with Don about City Hall Park and that, uh, what you said about Cal Anderson is totally true, where at City Hall Park we had SPU, we had the county, Sound Transit, Parks, and SDOT, and to be able to create the solution that was before the pandemic that worked, pandemic closed all of that great work down, but then that translated to us being able to do the same thing in Ballard with the Ballard Commons Park, using that reopening as the pilot for the Parks Department to reopen City Hall Park, which I think they were more successful at City Hall Park with their reopening than ours, right? I mean, but that's the benefit of getting to do it multiple times. Um, just going through uh, permitting. Boy, oh boy, are you spot on. Um, and so I asked the city auditor to audit every permit review desk. That permit is currently, it was supposed to be delivered in June. It's gonna be delivered in August or September. I'm excited for this. It does not, unfortunately, talk about street cafe permitting. Um, you know, it doesn't talk about the other jurisdictions like liquor control board that are outside of the city. It really focuses on the building permits. Um, but this is just gonna be the first round. And it, while the land use committee won't have the time to take up the recommendations from this permitting audit this year, that's something we're gonna do next year, right? And um, because it shouldn't, you shouldn't have a longer wait time from permit application to issuance to certificate of occupancy. You should, that time shouldn't be longer than it took to build the Space Needle, right? Like that's what we're talking about here. Um, because it is more than, it's more than just building buildings. It is addressing the issues from the past, as you mentioned. Um, it's about just getting that certificate of occupancy. It is about um, significant alterations. Like if there was a mistake made in West Seattle, and you know, Councilmember Herbold, I'm happy to help if you've if you run into challenges getting getting to the bottom of how you um, what designation that building is, and what does 51% change mean? Because then if you're not, if you're in an area that is subject to SEPA, then you have to go through SEPA just to do the significant alteration. And that's even longer. I mean, and that's part of why I passed the SEPA threshold change for downtown, because we shouldn't be having significant alterations going through SEPA. Sorry, I'm going on a really long tangent, but I've got all the notes from what you were talking about, and I think it's just so, so spot on. Another piece of legislation that, we'll, that I'll be bringing soon is about vacant buildings, because I know for Aaron Goodman in Soto, if you've got a vacant industrial building, that's a problem. And we've had that in Ballard in our industrial area too. And so we're gonna be changing how vacant building monitoring program works and is enforced to hopefully bring better results. Um, one of the ideas stemming from U District last year about broken windows that turned into a real program, I think was success, very successful. I think it's something that we need to expand funding for and expand eligibility or have something that is tied for some of our smallest businesses. Just one example, I was, uh, my office was working with a small business that is located in Ballard and Greenwood. They have two businesses so they could not um, apply, right? But we've got other local companies who I love that I dine at, that there's no shade here. It's just 
they have a parent company that is able to have multiple restaurants of the same parent company, but because they are um, filed differently, they're their own companies, and so each of those businesses get to have their, their windows replaced. But the this, this slightly smaller business that has only two locations, like we need to figure out a solution for them as well. Um, the, the pressure washing, I think, is, is exactly spot on. Um, I know working through the unified care team, that's something that as these neighborhood-based homelessness response teams are standing up and, be, and expanded throughout the city, that the desire is to have a truck that also has a pressure washer so that you don't have to rely on contractors. Um, but as that is still expanding, absolutely. Like we're, re <laughs> we're also relying on this partnership again. I mean, when Ballard brought up Uplift Northwest into Ballard, it was a game changer. Suddenly, all of the streets were actually litter free and the leaves were raked up. And I'll tell you, when the leaves are raked up in the fall, it makes a big difference for your walkability through the business district because it's whether or not the storm drains are filled, right? I mean, there's all these little things that you as BIAs are doing within your specific assessment area and working as an ecosystem between each other. Um, Quinn, about the flexible porous paving, it's shocking how much of a difference it makes. You stop tripping on, I mean, you don't, you stop tripping on, on the roots. Um, there's not trash. Most of the time people stop letting their dogs poop there and leaving it there. Um, right, I mean, and this is something that I think, it's, it, it's almost as if there needs to be a standardized plan for downtown, like neighborhood downtowns, where when you have this business district, there are certain things that the city does, like flexible porous paving. I, it's shocking how much of a difference such a little thing can make. Um, and like this, this beautiful, uh, cooperation, if you will, where we've got Seafood Fest and the West Seattle party happening this week. Mike, I will admit, I did a lutefisk eating contest last night. I will not be a participant on when, uh, next Saturday, Sunday, uh, but happy well, to be I'm a judge. I'm glad you're actually here today. <laughs> yeah, I would say um, that was gross. Uh, as any good, good Norwegian would say about lutefisk. Um, Getting to some of the public, to the asks, right, about public safety, how, how do we have those daily beats right away and now? And I know it's really, I was very supportive of the mid-expansion in downtown, and maybe that's something that happens in the BIAs as well. I mean, even when we had Uplift Northwest, they by no means were. Strauss, could you maybe, do, can they respond to anything or? Oh, sure, just raise your hand or interrupt. I, Okay, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> just, yeah, just interrupt me. Um, uh, I lo uh, having mid safety ambassador, you know, oh, we had Uplift Nor Northwest and by no means are they public safety people, but just like, having more people on the street regularly walking around, I think it is important that we have some sort of neighborhood ambassador. I know in Ballard, we now have community service officers doing walking patrols and that has had a positive impact. It's still something that we need to do more of and formalize how that works. Don, I see you want to say something. Uh, just really quick about the CSOs. I think it's a different type of program than what we were envisioning. Just the, the key to the success of these programs is geographically specific yep. people who are there every day yep. and from most of the hours. Like our program, we, we get there at 7.30 in the morning and we leave at 11 at night. And I mean, and our program to do that costs $400,000 a year to our BI, which is a lot. Right. Um, and so thinking about, but it's cheaper than cops, right? Totally. And, and so how do we, I mean, not every neighborhood has those resources to do that, but I think it's the yeah. specific people there over time that can collectively share that knowledge. Go ahead. Yeah, I agree. I just was thinking, I, I think it was about a month and a half ago when I first even found out about the CSOs uh -huh. <laughs> and I met them. I thought they were great. They said that they would have regular uh, patrols in West Seattle and I saw them again for the first time yesterday. Yeah. 
and yeah, they're yeah, great yeah. people, but there's, there's no consistency to Don's point. And I think getting to know the kind of characters that are hanging out in our own unique neighborhoods and, and being able to relate to them and help them and move things along is really going to be key to this program and the success of it. But I can't believe what he spends. I don't have that kind of money. Right. <laughs> Lisa, you, you raise oh, your hand. Just, just to layer on that, I think when we're talking about the presence, um, part of the key to that is the communication channels, mm -hmm. especially with yep. the business districts and organizations within, because we have a huge amount of information coming in. And if we can help pass along that information to help troubleshoot and shoot it back out to the neighborhood, that's when it all comes together. Because um, I think the presence is yeah. important, but if, if there's no relationships there, uh, across the neighborhood districts, then we're not going to be successful in that That's in right. that function. That's the same thing we're seeing at the parks. Is that, yeah. oh, sorry, um, is that what you're? You mentioned this last time, um, and uh, is that what you mean by a quarterback in the mayor's office? There's two things. You really you really need someone who is a quarterback at the city to pull together departments. Mm -hmm. And so it's an office job, but someone who's an expert with like black belt in city city departments. And then then there's the on the on the streets, people who go out there and walk and check in with businesses, very different role, but it's a part of that same equation where that information is collected. And then we can use that to deploy social services, to deploy um, strategies from the departments or the neighborhood investments, but that, that on the ground person or set of people, right now I think we have about eight ambassadors that do that work over the course of the week. Right. Um, that, that's what makes that information gathering, like Lisa was saying, and the lines of communication open. I think I agreed with everything that was said there. Um, and, you know, when I came into office, I'm going to use CSOs comparing to how we used to do homelessness outreach, which is when I came into office, we didn't have any geographically based homelessness outreach in our city. We do now, right? And there's still room for improvement. But Lisa, Lisa what you were saying about the regularity, the consistency, um, and what you were also saying about just needing to know, like, every day. Yeah, I'll see you every day. Maybe that's... A, we're open to suggestions. I hear that as as the request of that neighborhood consistency in um, every day in certain hours, because, it, and I just see with the CSOs, the community service officers in Ballard, like I see them because I share my district office with where the North Precinct has their substation and the CSOs are in there as well. Um, and so I think I probably see them a little bit more because they're doing their paperwork and, and getting ready to go out and do their next thing. And the Department but, of Neighborhoods has really changed also over time. Back in the day, there used to be mm -hmm. yeah, a regular presence in community councils, et cetera. So that's exactly where I was just going with that, which is like I, as a district council member, use my district office as a, to try to support what Department of Neighborhoods used to do um, because that used to be a Department of Neighborhoods space and is now finance and administrative services. And so it's by using that physical space to create the hub between the police, between CSOs, between our outreach workers, between, I mean, and then me just having that front presence and being able to look across the street to see Mike. But Aaron, you've got something. I think what everything you're saying makes total sense. And I think we need to kind of lift up what Quinn said earlier about wanting to be a BIA and yep. the fact that this public-private partnership enables districts to increase their capacity to support. And so as you know, we look forward to one thing that the city can look at other neighborhoods that might be primed to become a BIA to you know, both work with the city and help that process. But that seems like something that would be a good role for the city to take. I, again, uh, this is agreement here because even it's, it's interesting, like I represent Northwest Seattle, but I've worked with Aaron about vehicle residency outreach. We use University Heights, which is not a BIA, but is associated. And this is how we, again, with this ecosystem that we're working in. And frankly, we've also got the Finney Neighborhood Association in my district. That I'd they, like to move on a little bit to, um, can I ask a question when you're done? Sure. Let me just finish this thought and I'll pass it back to you, which we've also got, I mean, much like Little Saigon, we've got the Finney Neighborhood Association that is doing a lot of this work and even not in Finney, in Greenwood. I mean, Finneywood. Uh, <laughs> um, where it's important to be able to support you to become a BIA because kind of going back to what I first said about that partnership with Mike and government relations, for you to have that consistent funding to be able to do the work every day 
is what sets you up to be able to do this. Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're exploring options to expand the CID BI into Little Saigon. Yeah. Gotcha. I wanted to pick up on the insurance issue because I do remember this being, obviously, as a small business owner myself, I know that, number one, people don't report crime because they don't plan on, on submitting a claim because they don't want their premiums to go up. So that's one problem. So the, the crime statistics are not a reflection of reality. Number two, um, there are insurances, insurance companies that have pulled out of this market and the remaining policies are extremely expensive. So I understand the difficulty. And when you um, asked for a, a study last year, I, I looked into it a little bit. I, I did some provisional pricing. And then I was thinking, gosh, what, um, what good would a study be to just simply surface what everybody knows if council doesn't have the power to do anything about it? But I am hearing that um, this is top of your list still, and uh, there's got to be something, maybe, <laughs> that we can do. Or I don't know. I'm just saying that I'm hearing you, and um, I need to find out with, in, in partnership with you guys um, and what the next step should be, because it is a problem, and we can't have that being the reason why um, businesses are leaving town because they can't get insurance. So that is an incredibly important issue. And Councilmember um, Nelson, sure. hold on, please. Uh, I was going to respond. Go ahead. Yeah. Do you have a moment? Do you have a, a note on the insurance? Exactly. E exactly. Just that. And something that I've noticed as I've been looking into this issue as well is that with our current insurance commissioner being a bit asleep at the wheel that so OIR does play a role here to right. find out and, yep and we have the ability because the current insurance commissioner is not running for re-election that I think it's going to be important that we have a, an insurance commissioner that really fights back on insurance companies because when insurance companies just have free reign to deny claims to raise co-pays to and it's it's not even just about business insurance. It's like there are homes in eastern Washington that aren't able to get home insurance because yep. they're in a fire zone, right? And so, and this is because the, our insurance commissioner has not been up to par. So, I should... Tol yeah, there is, uh, there's that. And also what you said, Aaron, which was that we, that the city has contributed to the problems why there is, it's difficult to get insurance. And so... Um, it's a whole big thing that we have to address, but definitely making sure that uh, we understand better the landscape, I think, would be you know, historically how many, <clears throat> how many companies operated here, how many are now, et cetera, et cetera. I think that, that is a valuable avenue of inquiry. Thank yep. you. And also um, leadership at the state, and we can engage our, like I said, um, our Office of, Ec of International Relations. So, Don, would you like to, so basically I've got a whole list of items that I don't feel like I need to um, respond to. You've raised them, permitting, 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 public safety, public safety, public safety. New issue for me is solid waste. I did, I was not aware. Um, and that seems perhaps like a fixable thing. Just kidding. Uh, it, everything is complex and, um, but I really appreciate now understanding what is going on. And this is the beginning of a conversation on these issues, not the end, of course. So go ahead, Don. I was just going to say, uh, some of these themes, another way to look at them is that commercial districts just have a, a, a really interesting lens to be applied so that you can, that just problems get more complicated when you look at a commercial district. And the garbage is one of those examples. I think land use and its intersection with permitting and all that, that, that also is another lens of like, when you apply it to a commercial district, there's impacts to small businesses that might not apply if you're looking at a different neighborhood. And, and you have to set these laws up to kind of work for the whole city. But then there's these other lens you sometimes need to zoom in and kind of apply. So I appreciate having the entree to come to this conversation and be able to do, to kind of zoom in on some of these issues. So thank you. Okay, and I, I, a couple of positive things I heard, which was low turnover. I love those two words put together. So that was good to hear about. I also heard high vacancy rate also. So um, I understand that there, uh, that, um, well, you've got higher vacancy rate than downtown. Downtown's is 22%, or at least it was mm -hmm. in May. That was up 2% from uh, the, the same time last year. So these are not good trends. We got to get office workers back in the office, et cetera, but um, 
noting that vacancy is an issue, but it's good to hear that there is uh, that there is some stable tenancy amongst your businesses as well. I think, Chris, you wanted to say something, and then let's, um, maybe we can, did you raise your hand? No? Okay, I will um, open it up to any of my colleagues for uh, further questions or discussions, and then um, I am not, this, I would like to, you to, um, if we have missed anything or if you have any last words, please go ahead and speak up now because this is an important conversation. Chair, may we just yes. want to thank you for having us and having this ongoing conversation that it's not just that we came once and presented, but that we're building that ongoing conversation goes a long way towards the communication challenges and coordination challenges we've discussed. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Strauss. Yeah, Sorry. Just, I'm excited to continue the partnership. I mean, through all of this different work and one thing that I really am, hear <clears throat> am hearing and I think is a, a the fast solution is just having those hub coordinators in every neighborhood because yes. having one person to then know who everyone in the city is to, to talk to and then to work with the district council member, et cetera, it, it's, it's a smart decision. So, and I'm excited to work with you on all of these issues. Thank you. Thank you. And we are coming up to the mid-year supplemental and the fall budget deliberations. And we've been, we all know what our budget situation is, but part of this conversation, for me at least, was to focus our attention on uh, your needs. And as I said, next time we will have a presentation from the Office of Economic Development, which will talk about some of their um, intentional investments that, uh, that touch on a lot of what you've already addressed. You all know how to reach me, and I just have to say thank you very, very much. This is, um, this is how I learn what I need to know to help you. So, thank you very much. I thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now is the time in the, uh, in the meeting where I say, is there any other business before us? Yeah, good to see you, Quinn. And I am not seeing any other hands. So, uh, this concludes the agenda of the July 12th meeting of the Economic Development Technology and City Light Committee. Our next meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, July 24th, 2023 at 9.30 a.m. And right now we've tentatively got scheduled, as I've noted already, um, the Office of Economic Development's Future of Seattle Economy presentation, a, um, a resolution about uh, a... Um, about that is associated with that and, and um, future investments that are going to be coming up this fall. And then a generational wealth presentation, um, two, four music commission reappointments, and a Seattle of City Light annual audit presentation. So that's coming up. And oh, 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 nope, I'm seeing Just that one, the. Really quick, I think the 24th yeah, is a Monday. Yeah, that is correct. And my staff is sending. Yes, I do mean 26th. So it is yeah, July 26th. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, July 26th, Wednesday. Okay, everybody, that's a wrap. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.